the mannequin became erratic, dragging its plastic legs shambling over to him. Repulsion rose in him, but as it got near him, he stood up, leaning over it, trying to see if he could intimidate it. It stopped and froze. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today we bring you SCP Foundation Euclid Class Object SCP-847. SCP-847 is a broken human female mannequin, constructed of human hair and an unknown composite fibrous polymer that abrades and shatters similarly to porcelain. Exploratory laparoscopy of 847 shows the presence of internal structures that closely resemble an incomplete set of bones, organs, and major blood vessels, each of which are composed of the same polymer. Small trace amounts of a black, volatile resin similar to plastination compounds leak from the eyes and damaged regions of the mannequin. 847 favors clothing designed for young women, leaving ample skin exposed. The mannequin moves with erratic, stiff motions while shuddering to maintain balance. It has three different behavioral patterns, known as Pattern Z, Pattern Y, and Pattern X. Pattern Z occurs when there is no human within 50 meters. 847 remains inanimate and silent 99.5% of the time under these conditions. It will stand in front of any available full-length mirror and make a pose that showcases its outfit. On rare occasions, 847 will scratch short messages on nearby surfaces with a finger. Examples of messages written include, Don't leave me. You can own me. I can change. And you're my master. Pattern Y is adopted when there are only males around. Initial stage behaviors involve emitting vocalizations resembling high-pitched whimpering and gasps, in addition to more provocative poses. After three to five minutes of the initial stage, 847's behavior enters a secondary stage, during which it becomes fully animate, approaching any male subject, attempting to look into the subject's eyes. Vocalizations during this period become more frequent and longer in duration. Subjects can handle and freely alter or pose 847 during this time. 847 will then shatter select portions of its body and or extract internal structures when the subject leaves. Once the shattering or extraction is complete, it emits sobbing vocalizations and reverts back to Pattern Z. Pattern X occurs when any female subject approaches within 50 meters, whether male subjects are present or not. It will emit vocalizations resembling distressed grunts and screeches before becoming immediately animate and physically attacking any woman nearby. During Pattern X, 847's strength and speed are greatly increased, with sprints of up to 45 kilometers per hour and exertion of 40 kilonewtons of force having been measured. During an attack, 847 will occasionally shatter an appendage, usually a finger or toe in order to produce a sharp edge. Furthermore, plastination resin is released from its eyes, mouth, and shattered sections of its body. Resin falling in open wounds results in a quick hardening of soft tissues that spread until the victim's body reaches a composition of a similar polymer as 847. Following plastination, it will harvest selected body parts from the victim corresponding to damaged sections of its own body. It will fuse these parts to its body via the resin. Not all damaged sections will be repaired in this way. Upon completion of harvesting, it will return to pattern Y if there is a male subject around, or it will return to pattern Z when it is alone. The resin produced by 847 has been shown to have its anomalous plastination effects occur only when applied to soft tissues of women. The resin has no effect on cadaverous, non-human, or male tissue. Application of high voltage electricity in excess of 10 kilovolts will cause a temporary solidification of the resin, resulting in 847 becoming inanimate for approximately five minutes, regardless of the behavior pattern expressed at the time. SCP-847 was first discovered during a federal human trafficking investigation. It was found in the basement of an abandoned department store in Las Vegas on 8-23-1983, surrounded by partially disassembled and broken non-anomalous female mannequins wrapped in plastic sheets. 
FBI agents on the scene witnessed 847 exhibit pattern Y upon their discovery of the subject. Initially, agents believed that it was a trafficking victim, so they moved in to intervene and assist. 847 then switched to pattern X and attacked one of the female agents. The agent subdued 847 with her stun gun and was evacuated from the basement. However, despite signs of human habitation, the trafficking victims were never found. On September 23, 2013, researcher Tyler Jensen and Dr. Tyrone Hardy decided to put subject D-7294 into SCP-847's containment as part of an observational test. D-7294 was told to sit directly in front of the mannequin, converse, and lightly interact with it. He was warned to not damage 847 for the duration of the test, which was not to be longer than 20 minutes. The lights flashed on when D-7294 entered the testing area. The mannequin, it looked decrepit, worn down, horrendous. It had hair on it, clothes, all its body parts, but even just sitting in the chair on the other side of the room, he could tell how pitiful it looked. He had not felt this disgusted looking at something resembling a woman in a long time. 20 minutes to interact with an ugly mannequin like this would feel like an eternity. It shuddered. D-7294 looked taken aback, raising an eyebrow in surprise. It was not the most shocking or grotesque display he saw since being a D-Class, but it was repulsive in its own right. As he watched, it made small, sudden adjustments to its position. It looked like a puppet, being pulled on its strings. He could only watch in fascination as it kept moving like a puppet, as if it was inviting him, wanting him to play. Ten minutes passed like this, and then intercom buzzed. D-7294, if you refuse to participate in testing, I'm watching. Carry on then. It was then that the mannequin stood up, gasping and leaning in his direction. And he felt his heart soar. The way the mannequin headed over to where D-7294 was sitting, the mannequin became erratic, dragging its plastic legs, shambling over to him. Repulsion rose in him. But as it got near him, he stood up, leaning over it, trying to see if he could intimidate it. It stopped and froze. You're adorable, aren't you? He muttered, grabbing its arm and moving it around. It made more noises while D-7294 played with it. He let go and walked around behind it, grabbing various body parts to move around and pose. He ran a hand across its eyes, shuddering at how real they felt. Real eyes, porcelain skin, your hands feel cheaper than everywhere else. You couldn't ever attract a male like this, could you, you dumb animal? It continued making sounds, this time sounding vaguely fearful. D-7294 let go and walked back to its front, feeling its hands and fingers. Make some actual sounds this time. Talk to me. He broke off a finger. Nothing had changed. Useless. He could immediately faintly hear the sounds of guards rushing towards the testing chamber as he let go and backed away. The mannequin erratically jerking towards his position. The intercom buzzed. D-7294, you were instructed not to damage the item. Testing is over. The guards opened the door and started to forcefully drag him out. He didn't resist, continuing to stare at the mannequin until the doors closed. He sighed feeling slight disappointment mixed with a rush of thrill. 50 meters away from the area, heading towards an interview room, he could hear screaming and the sound of something breaking. He grinned and felt warmth in his head. 7294 laid in his bed that night, absent-mindedly thinking of the encounter earlier with the mannequin. It was the first real sense of enjoyment he had gotten in months. Although from how the researchers had talked to him, he had a distinct feeling he wouldn't be returning to see it again. It was fun playing with it while he could, at least. The memory of his fun was burned into his mind to enjoy for nights forwards. He rolled, looking up at the ceiling, sighing. He stuck out his thumb and index finger to resemble a tweezer 
and started plucking at nothing, humming about Mary's little lamb, her fleece as white as snow. Oh God, there were the bowls, the ones we'd been eating out of, but the meat, it wasn't beef or pork, it was him, and the rice, maggots, crawling in his flesh. He'd have to have been dead for days. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today, we bring you SCP Foundation Keter Class Object SCP-953. SCP-953, also known as the polymorphic humanoid, is a female red fox with nine tails. It displays polymorphic properties and enjoys taking the form of various other objects and beings, most commonly an attractive Korean female. The one weakness to its transformations is that it keeps at least one part of its true form when in human form. This allows it to be easily spotted in a group just by searching for the one person with fox features, whether it is a tail, ears, paws, or something else. However, it will use clothing to try and hide these features. In addition to polymorphic abilities, 953 displays moderate level psionic abilities, namely suggestion and telepathy. <laughs> Although insufficient to fool an outside observer, a deceived victim can be convinced of a variety of false facts, including the nature of 953, its own nature, and the nature of things around it. 953 has used this in the past to deceive a police officer into believing there was no screaming coming from a hotel room where she was staying, convince a mother to roast and eat her own child, and also performing a disgusting necrophiliac acts towards the fiancé of Agent Ramsey. SCP-953 has been encountered by the SCP Foundation numerous times, with the first encounter having taken place in Busan, Korea, shortly after the Second World War. To date, 953 has escaped and been recovered six times, resulting in the deaths of many SCP agents during various incidents. After its latest escape, 953 was not heard from for over a few years, until suddenly resurfacing in Pennsylvania at Yifkan which it had been attending in the guise of a fury enthusiast. Before being captured, 953 carried out over an estimated 27 murders of convention staffs and attendees, more than any other single incident to date. The mutilated bodies were found in various places throughout the hotel, including inside a mattress, hanging from a shower curtain, and served as the main course at a hotel banquet. Surviving attendees were administered Class A amnestics and released from Foundation custody. Foundation personnel assigned to capture 953 after this latest incident noted that the subject appeared listless and apathetic and did not resist capture. No further casualties have resulted from 953 from that date. SCP-953 is to be kept in a 4 by 3 by 3 meter containment cell at the end of Hallway 99 at Site 17. 953 is to be provided with 1.5 kilograms of fresh liver daily for consumption, clean drinking water in plentiful quantities, clean beddings to be exchanged by 953 and laundered weekly. Small luxury items like plum wine and reading materials may be provided as an occasional reward for good behavior as part of psychological conditioning. Direct human contact with SCP-953 is strictly forbidden due to SCP-953's mind-altering properties. For this reason, all personnel must stay outside the 100-meter safety zone when the sealed door is opened. Delivery of food and other items will be carried out by an automated robotic assistant. If containment fails, 953 can be theoretically terminated by gunfire. However, due to its nature, Recognizing 953 may be difficult. Because of the inadequacy of purely physical containment procedures to control SCP-953, psychological containment is also necessary. For this reason, the approach to SCP-953's containment chamber is to be lined with open cage dog kennels, preferably of the Korean Jindo or American Foxhound breed. 953 displays an extreme phobia of domesticated canines and will not pass within 10 meters of one, especially when canines are barking or alerted. She also hates it and tends to get agitated when she's referred to as kitsune, the Japanese word for fox, instead of a kumiho, which is instead a Korean nine-tailed fox. 
953 is to be considered hostile to human life, dangerous, and armed at all times. Any transport must be done under the supervision of at least six armed personnel. Its preferred killing method is a barehanded strike to the abdomen, penetrating the abdominal cavity and removing the liver, which it will later consume. If given time, however, it will choose to linger over its kill, torturing its victim, as it seems to enjoy the infliction of pain upon another sentient being. <laughs> One of 953's most disgusting acts was when a Japanese agent, probably better known as Agent 3, and his two other teammates, hereby known as Agent 1 and Agent 2, were sent out to capture 953. Agent 3 was the only survivor of the incident, during which he accomplished the task of capturing 953 alive. The following is a transcript of the after-action debriefing that took place following SCP-953 securement. We got on site and went to the morgue, looked at the bodies. I used the cover story of a reporter investigating the crimes, told them Agent 1 and Agent 2 were my photographer and assistant. Turns out they were thinking that it was a wild animal, based on the nature of the wounds and a little old lady's account. The old lady saw 953 eating her cow when she went out into the rice field. Then we saw this girl sitting under a waterfall, combing out her hair. She had this thin robe on. We knew it had to be 953 because of her feet. She was trying to hide them, but she wasn't doing it right. Agent 1 and Agent 2 smiled. Even I thought we had the edge on her. Oh God, we were stupid. She knew we were after her. She knew we knew what she was. She <laughs> pretended to let her guard down just enough so that we could feel smug in our overconfidence. She told us that she had a cottage nearby, offered to serve us dinner, introduce us to the others. Agent 1 and Agent 2 thought we should go with her, said there was a chance there might be other victims. She took us to this cottage, a pretty little place, old and rustic, but really homey. She took us inside, served us dinner. Agent One calls her a perfect wife, demure, kind, sweet, and respectful. She served us rice and pickled turnips and some kind of meat. Then we went to bed feeling sleepy and tired. In the middle of the night, I woke up and saw that Agent One wasn't there, figured he'd gone to take a pee or something, so I decided to go for one myself. I went behind a bush and saw, well, she was there with Agent One, and they were kissing. Suddenly, she bit his tongue off, all of it, and then she spit it out and showed it to him, just so that he could see it happening. Agent One tried to scream, but she'd torn his throat out with her teeth. Then she stabbed her hand into his belly. Agent One was gurgling and trying to push her off. He was bleeding all over the place, but she just pushed him to the ground and started working her fingers in his belly, reached in deep and pulled his liver out like she was gutting a fish and swallowed it whole. Then she started peeling his skin off like an orange or something. I didn't stop to watch. I ran back to the room, shook Agent 2 awake, told him we needed to get going. I went for our weapons grabbed my 45 and then agent one walked in asking what was wrong so i shot him he was dead his eyes were glowing yellow what the hell kind of human being has glowing yellow eyes agent two grabbed his gun and pointed it at me he started yelling at me to put the gun down and that's when 953 grabbed him from behind and the gun went off he shot me in the upper shoulder I fell down screaming, and I heard a loud cackling laugh. I crawled into the living room where we'd had dinner earlier that night and tried to slam the door shut. Rice paper screen, not going to help, but I just, I needed something between us. There, I saw a man laid out where the dining table had been. His eyes were wide open, and his skin was flayed open. Oh God, there were the bowls the ones we'd been eating out of. But the meat, it wasn't beef or pork, it was him. 
and the rice? Maggots. Crawling in his flesh. He'd have to have been dead for days. But how? We'd seen him at the base of the mountain just yesterday. I threw up. There were... Some of them were still alive. Crawling in my vomit. I stabbed her in her gut with a punji stick, which slowed her down a bit. And then I dragged myself across the river. Couldn't swim, hit my head on the rocks, went downstream at least half a mile through the rapids. I got to the van, broke a window, and grabbed a flamethrower. I flicked on the sparker, managed to get it around just as she came out of the tree line. And that was when the retrieval team found me with 953. They took her away and got me to a hospital. I had a raging infection for days. I don't know how it happened, nor do I know what I did to deserve something like this to happen to me, but it did. I was just minding my own business, walking through the metropolitan area of Tokyo. All of a sudden, everyone vanished, and the world around me took on a deep red hue. Confused and scared, I looked for the closest thing to normal I could find, which happened to be a candy shop of all places. Inside, even the contents of the store had that bloody red color too. The liquid candies, on the other hand, took on a deep black color that resembled squid ink. I slumped against the counter and pondered what I would do, or could do, to escape this place. My decision was made for me, however, when a woman opened the door to the store, she had long black hair that nearly reached the floor, and clawed hands that were stained crimson, darker than the world around me. Her mouth was covered by a surgical mask that failed to cover up the scars that must have extended out from her lips. The next thing she did was remove said mask, revealing two sets of razor-sharp teeth. She then smiled, I think. It was hard to tell considering that her mouth reached her ears. Dozens of scars extended outwards from her lips. Her gaze was completely locked onto me when she was approaching me, easily towering over me as well. Am I pretty? She asked. Stupefied by this question, I reflexively answered with a quick, no. Stupid mistake on my part. The next thing I knew, my eardrums burst. She let out a horrifying shriek that brought me to the ground in pain and terror. The last thing I remembered as I clutched my bleeding ears was looking up to see a clawed hand closing in on my neck. I was positive I'd been decapitated as the world blurred on by and my head rolled on the ground. But no sooner did my head stop rolling than I returned back to Tokyo the real Tokyo. I quickly clutched my throat and patted my body wildly as people watched on. How I survived and where I went? Hell if I know. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today, we bring you SCP Foundation Euclid Class Object SCP-6979. SCP-6979, also known as Night Parade of a Single Demon, is a humanoid entity that resembles a ghost by all appearances with a mutilated face and exceptionally long claws. 6979 itself lives in a separate yet connected dimension to our own. Many may know 6979 by her most famous moniker, the Slit-Mouthed Woman. However, 6979 only takes on this form in order to feed on belief from humanity so as to continue her own existence. She can feed on this belief in her by either killing or frightening her prey summarily causing others to believe in and fear her. However, due to an agreement with the Foundation, all deaths and attacks associated with 6979 have ceased. The dimension that 6979 originates is called Memonikai, designated as SCP-6979-1. This place appears to be an exact replica of Japan, except for a few characteristics that stand out. All light within the dimension is a dark shade of red, all grounds are covered in soot, all liquids are black, and all electronic devices are damaged unless connected to a power source upon entry into the dimension. The actual extent to how much of Japan is recreated here is unknown. The only method to get into Mamanokai is to dematerialize and rematerialize into it by being in contact with 6979. Apparently, there are portals that grant access to this dimension but they are currently inactive due to some sealing rituals the Foundation has yet to decipher. Furthermore, the other inhabitants that exist within 6979-1, collectively referred to as SCP-6979-2, 
Well, that's the designation they would have been given if they hadn't all been exterminated by the Imperial Japanese Anomalous Matters Extermination Agency, or IJAMEA, during the 1930s. It is for that reason that 6979 is now the sole inhabitant of Mamanokai. An operation was carried out to determine 6979's sentience. The plan was to send a D-Class to an area as bait and to ask the entity questions. Twelve agents were stationed around the area should the situation go awry. When 6979 appeared, the D-Class proceeded with the prepared questions. However, 6979 appeared guarded and then began to demanifest. As if a sudden surge of courage overcame him, the D-Class reached out and grabbed its hand. Together, they vanished and reappeared in 6979-1. The D-Class regained consciousness and noticed that his surroundings were tinted red. Still on the ground, he looked up and screamed when he saw 6979, who was now dressed in a traditional ritual white kimono with much longer hair and sharp claws instead of hands. Its mouth had been turned vertically, now extending from where its right eye used to be, down to its chin and neck and into its chest, disappearing under its kimono. Its left eye seemed to have partially morphed with its right one into a single organ. The umbrella it carried was made of red paper with several holes in it. Oh my God, please spare me. 6979 tilted its head then crouched and stared at him directly. Leave. Now. Its gaze remained fixed on the still trembling D-Class. Oh, for sure. I'll do that. If you'll just tell me wh where the exit is. But 6979 only lifted its claw and said, There is no exit but death. Oh, uh, let's not do that then. 6979 lowered its claw. Why have you come here? Who sent you? Me coming here wasn't part of the plan. My, uh, government was trying to stop you from killing people on, uh, the, the other side. Am I a monster to be stopped now for mere dozens of lives? Yes, even a single life is... Don't you dare reproach me for what your filthy ill cause. Bad deeds are punishments themselves. Nay, to say a hundred victims is punishment for your actions would be an insult to the suffering you've inflicted upon my world. The D-Class was dumbfounded so he remained silent. Judging from your reaction, you probably don't know what the people from your world did to mine. Very well, I'll tell you. I need you to know, else my pain, the pain of my people, would be not forgotten. Come, walk with me. 6979 turned around and the D-Class followed. Together, they walked past many dilapidated houses. I've been suffering for many years now. Wandering aimlessly through the burnt remains of what I called home. Only by taking on the identity of a murderous beast in your realm was I able to survive. Soon, they arrived at an empty lot with a building made of concrete. You see, this place? This was built by your government, your empire, when they came to conscript us. It was actually made by us. Because why would the Imperial Army sully their hands with hard labor? 6979 pointed towards an empty crate with the phrase Property of the Empire of Great Japan and the logo of IJAMEA. This is where we were trained by your people to fight for your empire. They used us as weapons against some foreign countries that I don't even remember the names of. And so... They demanded absolute obedience in the fear of us betraying them out on the battlefield. <laughs> Believe me when I say that they got what they asked for. Scores of us were sent out to the battlefield in your world, only to die within days. Eventually, after everyone but a handful of us were left, the Emperor realized that everything they did with us was nothing but a waste of time. Thousands of us, dead. <laughs> Only to be thought a minor waste of time and resources by an uncaring tyrant. Still, why waste anything? So, they sent the rest of us out to die for the glory of their empire. Only I survived after faking suicide. Looking like a bloodied up corpse made it easy. Look at me. I am sorry. I had no idea. If it's any consolation, I believe the age of imperialism is now over. I'm sure. We tried to fight back, of course, using powers of magic, brute force, 
and even the unbridled fury of those you consider deities. In the end, we failed against the might of the Emperor's Imperial soldiers. Oh, how they slaughtered us with their weapons, causing many of us to give up on the fight before it really started. After all, what use is control over lightning if two well-placed bullets can snuff out your life? They remained silent for a moment. I'll make sure I let our people know. I promise. As I wish to be alone with my thoughts. Very well. Again, there's only one way to return to your world from this place. Death. 6979 lifted its claw in the air. I'll make it as painless as I possibly can. You deserve this much. That's not really that comforting. <sighs> I tried. Ready? The D-Class inhaled sharply and closed his eyes as he stilled himself. Sure, sure. And why not? Better sooner than... 6979 swiped its claw at his neck, decapitating him in one clean cut. Before his head touched the ground, the D-Class faded into nothingness and reappeared back in his reality. After hearing the report, the Foundation set to work on unlocking and fixing the portals to Memonokai. It appears that the blocked portals are what had been forcing 6979 to come to our world to feed. In doing so, they would be able to offer 6979 some comfort in all that it had lost. With the portals finally reopened, 6979 no longer needed to feed on humanity's beliefs any further. When asked why that was, she didn't answer, and only smiled instead. Being a researcher with the Foundation is petrifying, to say the least. The paycheck is amazing. I'd probably be able to retire in only a few years with all my salary, but only if I'm still alive then. It's kind of funny to think that something like the Foundation has things like HR department, payroll and benefits, etc. Despite housing the most bizarre and even dangerous anomalies on the planet and quite possibly the universe. Personally, out of all the heinous and grotesque anomalies we have, the one that perturbed me the most was the damn cyborg. Tell me, doctor, have you ever seen someone be held down and vivisected without anesthesia, forcefully kept alive throughout the process, and watched as their organs and skin being harvested with surgical precision? And then to see yourself be a part of some cybernetic freak of nature? There's just something about the dispassionate manner in which it uses its tools to cut and slice apart human flesh. The sound of it operations and victims scream from an orchestra of horror. I know we gave the thing D-Class to toy around with to see what it does, but even some of those hardened criminals didn't deserve deaths like that. I've begun to question my role here, but as I've said, the pay is too good. Now, are we done here, Dr. Abalan? Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today, we bring you a SCP Foundation Euclid Class Object SCP-2878. SCP-2878, also known as Reverse Cyborg, is a humanoid entity primarily constructed from steel and common electronics. It stands at approximately 10 feet tall when fully erect but normally prefers to stand with its back hunched. Speaking of posture, 2878 is humanoid in appearance, but more accurately resembles an ape with its long, bulky arms and midsection with short yet powerful hind legs. It also uses its knuckles to move. Furthermore, said knuckles have retractable claw-like appendages. It must be noted that the vast majority of its external metal coverings are damaged or missing but it is making attempts to rectify such damages. More on that later. 2878 possesses intelligence equal to that of an average man, but has incredibly advanced knowledge in specific areas, mechanical engineering, cybernetic augmentation, and logical reasoning. However, it lacks the ability to comprehend the minds of humans. In other words, the concept of human empathy is incredibly foreign to 2878. Several have proposed that, due to the cybernetic adjustments made to itself, it has severely hampered its ability to empathize in favor of specializing in the aforementioned areas. It is due to this that it has zero social awareness. 2878 is hostile, predatory, exceedingly aggressive to all human life, and will not hesitate to attack as soon as one is noticed by it. Those who are captured by 2878 will be forcefully held down and brutally vivisected so that it can harvest its victim's organs and replace its damaged components on the outside of its body. 
All other flesh is then converted into some kind of viscous liquid which it will drink for sustenance. 2878 uses the decapitated head of a woman, which was missing her jaw to serve as its own head. The head can see and hear, but only make throaty grunts and gurgles. On one or two occasions, the head was capable of providing some words in Spanish with great effort. In locations where its steel plates are missing, on its techno-organic flesh, it has transplanted the skin of multiple individuals on top of it as a replacement. No wastes have been found from 2878. Researchers assume that all that is consumed is absorbed into its body, wasting nothing. 2878 possesses two hearts, most likely to help push a large amount of blood through its cardiovascular system. Multiple human legs have been grafted onto its right leg. However, all the legs are experiencing decay, cell death, and infections due to massive weight of 2878. Although it appears to be inactive most of the time, 2878 is in fact aware of its surroundings. An unfortunate incident was brought to light in a counseling session between the lead researcher, Dr. G, and the on-site psychologist, Dr. Abalan. All right, Doc, tell me, what's bothering you? Dr. G took a deep breath before recalling the incident and the horror he had witnessed. We were performing our routine checkup around the containment facilities. One of the junior researchers under my wing, Bahitia, stepped up to the door's voice activation panel to open the door. The moment Bahitia stepped in, she was unlucky enough to be next to the door of 2878's containment chamber that was left open. Damn it, how can people be so damn careless? I'm sorry, doctor. It was a most disastrous error, I'm sure. You're damn right it was. Some fool was careless enough to leave the door ajar a door that holds one of the most violent anomalies we have? It was able to see Bahitia. Without warning, it reached for the door, ripped it open, and pulled her in before we could do anything. <laughs> Dr. G was beginning to sob. The psychologist only remained silent until he continued. We immediately ran from the scene, like a bunch of cowards, and alerted the security team. They arrived after 10 minutes. Bahitia was killed in two. We were then holding out in a secured cell nearby, watched the surveillance feed closely as Bahitia was brutally and surgically abused. I, oh God, Bahitia, I, I can't go on. I know it's hard, doctor, but please try to remember. What did 2878 do to Bahitia? 2878 used a single claw to tear her up. It was quick and efficient. It prevented her from bleeding out. It then extended a series of wire connected to her to provide some kind of life support. Right after that, 2878 then immediately extended a multitude of wires and scalpels from its claws. As much as I hate to relive and admit it, its operation was surgical. It was brilliant. It was unlike anything I've seen. Bahitia's vitality slowly ebbed away soon after that. 2878 then blended her body into a pulpy, fleshy liquid and consumed it. Then it added the pieces it stole from her into its own body through augmentation. Her screams, oh God, the image of her body being twisted. They won't leave my mind. I couldn't sleep after that. How did you manage to neutralize the anomaly after that? The Foundation Tech Team was able to hack into 2878's system and gained control, but it didn't last. Six hours after her death, 2878 began making wheezing and screaming sounds. After another 12 hours, its vocalizations had developed into monosyllabic grunts. 48 hours later, they recognized its vocalizations as some sort of garbled Spanish. They alerted me immediately, and a communication attempt was carried out via a drone-mounted radio. I entered the room where my assistant had hooked up to connect to the drone feed. I thought I had recovered, thought that I had accepted whatever happened to Bahidia as just an unfortunate accident. I thought I was calm, but when I stepped into the room and saw the abomination on the screen, all those painful memories, her screams, last images of her alive, all of them flooded my mind at once. It was painful. That thing is pure evil, I'm telling you. SCP-2878, can you hear me? It remains still and motionless. It didn't show any physical signs of noticing the drone. Through its garbled vocalizations, I could hear my name being spoken, 
and could tell that it wished me harm via the means of lacerations and at the same time wanted me to help it improve itself via augmentations. Before I could ask further questions, 2878's vocalization glitched. ID 59004, requesting access. That damn thing read Bahitia's mind before she died. It found out the access code to the door and said it loud and clear enough for the voice activation panel outside its cell to pick up. As it beeped and lit up green, the door whipped open and 2878 began to move. Oh my god, it's breaching containment. Shut it down, shut it down! I'm trying. It's resisting my attempts at gaining control. I couldn't get through to it. Oh god, it has blocked us out! But it was too late. 2878 was already out of its cell scanning its surroundings in search of more human targets. We have no choice. All right, we need to send in some men. Let's hope the EMP grenades will fry that damn thing's system. I specified that the security team equipped themselves with EMP grenades and electro rounds designed to stop machines. Luckily for us, the plan worked. An EMP grenade was tossed into the corridor where 2878 was and it set off an EMP pulse strong enough to disable 2878 as well as its surrounding. The drone went offline, and then I was watching the security forces cam footage. 2878 was stopped in its track, and it was motionless. Sparks shot out of its jumbled system as the men secured it. Dr. G stopped talking. His face was transfixed in an expression of horror as he began to tremble. And then what happened? The thing, although it was inactive, its two hearts were still beating and pumping blood through its biological components like it's half human, half machine. I'm telling you, that thing's an abomination. We have to terminate it. Dr. Abalan studied him briefly and began writing on his notepad. Well, unfortunately, that's not up for us to decide, doctor. And I feel a short vacation would do you some good. What say you take a break from work for now? We hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to click like, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell. Have a favorite SCP you want to see on this channel? Leave us your suggestions in the comments down below. In the meantime, if you'd like to see more SCP content, then check out some of our other videos right here. As always, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in our next video. Bye-bye.